Welcome to Explore History on YouTube. I'm Dr. Scott McLean, and today I will be examining one of the great heroes of British history, Lord Nelson. Lord Nelson gained legendary status on October 21st, 1805 at the Battle of Trafalgar. It was here that he defeated the combined French-Spanish fleet of Napoleon Bonaparte. This great victory against superior odds meant that the possibility of a French invasion of Britain was over. Now this alone was perhaps enough to give Nelson everlasting fame, but I would argue that there's much more to consider if we're going to truly understand why Lord Nelson is seen as one of the greatest figures in British history and an icon of British national identity. Horatio Nelson was born at Burnham Thorpe in Norfolk on September 27, 1758. His father was a county parson and his mother a distant kinswoman of Sir Robert Walpole, Britain's first Prime Minister. His mother's uncle, Maurice Suckling, was captain of a 64-gun battleship, and he offered to take the young Horatio to sea at the tender age of 12. Horatio was frail and delicate, but continued life at sea, acting as a cabin boy on a merchant ship to the West Indies, later serving an apprenticeship in navigation among the shoals of the Thames. At 14, he even took part in an Arctic expedition, and by 18, had spent two years as a midshipman on a frigate in the East Indies. In other words, from an early age, he acquired a great deal of practical experience of navigation and life at sea. This experience would serve him well in following years and in part add to the myth of Nelson. But there was many experienced men at sea. What was it that made Nelson stand out? It is obvious that like Napoleon, Nelson was a unique individual who had qualities which would enable him to rise quickly and make his mark. He was extremely knowledgeable in regards to navigation, seas, the capabilities of a ship and its crew. He also acquired a reputation for reckless bravery. He was innovative and not tied to traditional methods, and he was obsessed with doing his duty. At 18, he received his first independent command. He immediately wrote his father, stating, We all rise by deaths. I got my rank by a shot killing a post-captain, and I most sincerely hope I shall, when I go, get out of the world the same way. He married at 28 and spent the next five years living very poorly in England. To his great relief, the French Revolution broke out and he was called into service, spending the next four years cruising about the Mediterranean. Despite frail health, the loss of his right eye, he continued and quickly won a reputation for almost foolhardy gallantry. In 1796, he was recalled from the Mediterranean to help repel an invasion fleet from France. Off Cartagena, he fell in with two Spanish frigates and captured one of them. 1797, he met with a Spanish fleet of 27 battleships and 12 frigates, which he outmaneuvered, and he even turned around towards the fleet chasing him to save a man that fell overboard. Nelson showed incredible daring and foresight, and despite being the smallest ship in the fleet, would change the course of what became known as the Battle of St. Vincent. He assured an English victory by taking on the Santissima Trinidad, the largest ship in the world at the time. 112-gun ships. That's a monster ship. Nelson's exploits at Cape St. Vincent caught the nation's attention, and for his troubles, he was knighted. The following year, Nelson's luck would change when he was given the task of attacking the Spanish fortress of Tenerife, where it was believed Mexican treasure was being stored. The attempt to take the fortress failed, and his right arm was shattered. Yet he survived, and his reputation was barely tarnished. After nine months' convalescence, Nelson was back in the Mediterranean, where he was to try and acquire information on a massive fleet that was being assembled by Napoleon for his Egyptian campaign. Nelson would finally be pitted against Napoleon himself, something that would greatly add to the mystique surrounding his name. One of Nelson's frigates was able to capture a French corvette and was able to get sufficient information out of the crew to surmise that Napoleon was embarking on a major effort at conquest and colonization. Nelson was given command of the fleet, but he had no idea where Napoleon was headed. So Nelson chose Malta, a strategic position in the Mediterranean. Its capital, Valletta, was an important fortress built by the Knights of St. John. Napoleon, in fact, did go to Malta. He conquered the island, but Nelson narrowly missed his opportunity. In fact, at one point, the two fleets just missed each other, passing just out of sight. Nelson, believing that Napoleon was heading for Egypt, actually arrived there first, as the French fleet was slower and was trying to avoid the British. Nelson ended up leaving Egypt without engaging the French, who arrived within days of Nelson's departure. 
Nelson's failure to engage the French brought great criticism at home. Many demanded he be recalled, that the ministers who appointed him be forced to resign. But as luck would have it, Nelson got wind of the French fleet heading for Egypt, and he quickly went in pursuit. And here he would gain one of his great victories at what is known as the Battle of the Nile. On arrival, Nelson found the French fleet anchored in what they believed to be a secure harbor. With some skillful maneuvering, he attacked the fleet while navigating some very dangerous shoals. Once again, Nelson was wounded, this time in the forehead, and for a time he thought he was dying. But he recovered and he won a decisive victory. The victory was, quote, an astonishing testimony to the intensity and accuracy of British gunfire, to Nelson's leadership, and to the new school of close fighting he had initiated. Above all, it revealed in the hands of an inspired commander the quality of British discipline. Once news of the victory reached England, it was as if the country had been saved. Nelson was now the legitimate hero of the nation. The annual register described the victory as, quote, the most signal that had graced the British Navy since the days of the Spanish Armada. Nelson was the nation's hero. Yet intrigue would plague him over the next two years and tarnish his reputation. Specifically, he spent two years in Naples, much of that time involved in the company of Lady Hamilton, a married woman to whom he had fallen in love. At home, his conduct was frowned upon. When he finally returned, he was met with a mixed reception. In political and official circles, it was believed his career was all but finished. But once again, Napoleon would come to his rescue. With Napoleon becoming first consul and then emperor of France, Britain once again appeared to be in peril. Napoleon closed off all European ports to Britain, and there were rising fears of a possible invasion. Nelson, therefore, was called once again into action. He went north to the Baltic. Here, at the Battle of Copenhagen, Nelson once again daringly maneuvered the fleet. When given the signal to retreat, because he was second in command at this stage, he put the spyglass symbolically up to his blind eye, and he kept on going. He destroyed the Northern Coalition against Britain, opening the Baltic to British trade, shaking Napoleon's grasp on Northern Europe. Nelson was once again a hero in the public eye. After a few years of patrolling the Mediterranean and the English Channel, Nelson would once again be called in upon to save his country, facing his greatest challenge ever at Trafalgar. To understand the importance of the Battle of Trafalgar, we need to appreciate the high level of tension and fear in Britain. There was a constant fear of a French invasion, as all knew that if Napoleon was allowed to land, there would be little chance of a victory over the French. Nelson was therefore given the task of ensuring that an invasion could never happen. And the only way to do this was to completely destroy the combined French-Spanish fleet. Nelson was well aware of this fact and immediately began to devise a plan that would allow for the complete annihilation of the French fleet. The French-Spanish fleet was at Cadiz Harbour, was believed to be readying itself to move into the Mediterranean. On October 19, 1805, the French fleet left Cadiz, and October 21st, the battle began. Like Napoleon on land, Nelson was prepared to be innovative and break with traditional fighting tactics. He prepared meticulously so that each captain of each ship knew exactly what the role would be once the battle began. He decided against following the traditional strategy, breaking a formal line of battle. So instead of going towards the coming ships and then turning and going alongside, he decided to crash through them. But the downside was he was mortally wounded. In his last breath, he kept repeating, Thank God I have done my duty. And his last words are said to be, God and my country. So he died well, the stuff of legend. Breaking with naval tradition, he wasn't buried at sea. This was a tradition in the Navy for hundreds of years. You're killed in battle, you're put overboard. But he didn't want that. He wanted to be buried back in England. And so he was taken home in a cask of brandy because it was a six-week journey from Cadiz and he would have decomposed. His officers put him into a cask of brandy and he was taken back to England and buried in St. Paul's Cathedral. And so there are obviously many reasons why a great mythology arose around this figure, why he became a symbol of the English nation. First of all, he was victorious. He had many important victories and this would raise the status of any commander. But Nelson was something more. 
we have to look at the nature of his victories. He was often going against superior odds. Third, his opponent. He was facing Napoleon, a conqueror of Europe, and someone recognized as one of the greatest military minds of the time, and in fact, in history. Also, we look at the fear of invasion. Whether right or wrong, Nelson represented the last hope, the one thing that would preserve the British people and their way of life. We should also look at his military genius. Like Napoleon, he had all the right qualities as a commander. He was a great strategist. He was innovative. He was willing to break with tradition. He would do anything to gain victory, and he inspired loyalty in his men. Many sailors at this time were pressed into service, sometimes literally dragged onto ships and forced to act as sailors. So they hated the Navy, but all are described as loving serving under Nelson. He was daring. He took great risks. He inspired his men to continue fighting. Like Napoleon, he rose quickly through the ranks from modest beginnings to take command at a young age. And finally, we need to consider his personality. He was dedicated to his country. Doing his duty was foremost in his mind, and this was an extremely admirable quality. Because of this, he represented a rallying point for the British people. He and the qualities he represented became important parts of British national identity. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a little something about this very fascinating figure of British history. If you liked it and you would like to see more, you can subscribe to our channel. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, or you can visit the Explore History website at explorehistory.co.uk, where you can sign up to our newsletter. You can access the travel blogs and podcasts and the of course, the archives, which has thousands of pages of documents for you to look at. Thank you very much.